Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Bali in Amsterdam. And my name is Kirsten van den Hul, and I will be your host tonight. Um, also, a special welcome, and I try to look into the cameras, to the people joining us through live stream. There's quite a lot of, uh, of them because this event has sold out completely. So congratulations to, to all of you uh, here with us tonight. Um, yes, what are we going to do tonight? Well, um, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, this evening was organized um, uh, by the Bali in partnership with uh, the IISG, the uh, International Institute for Social History. Um, home, uh, I don't know if everybody here in the room is aware of that, but home to a, a considerable Marx archive since 1937, uh, which includes some unique UNESCO World Heritage pieces such as the only surviving uh, handwritten page of the Communist Manifesto. Um, and also a first edition of Das Kapital, hand connotated by the author himself. Well, this week, uh, the same IISG is hosting an international uh, conference, a scholarly conference on Marx writings, um, Unfinished and Unfinishable Project. Um, and some of the scholars attending that conference are actually with us tonight. So a special welcome to those guests as well. But of course, um, what we will be um, um, mainly discussing tonight is um, the work of Karl Marx and then especially seen through the eyes uh, of another hero of many of us here uh, in the audience tonight, David Harvey. Um, uh, welcome to you. Uh, author of uh, uh, this book, uh, among many others, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. Let's just uh, see a raise of hands. Who has read this book? Let's see, okay, still work to be done. Uh, I can highly recommend it. Um, sorry, sorry? It's really taken really place by storm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, now that we're at it, I'm, I'm just curious to see who we have in this audience. Is there anybody here who has never read uh, Das Kapital? Yeah. Yeah. People who have never read the Communist Manifesto? Yeah. There, there. Um, is there anybody here who considers themselves a Marx expert, maybe? <laughs> don't be shy. Don't be shy. We don't have any Marx experts. I saw a half-raised hand. Yeah, that, that was my next question. That was my next question, Marxists. Yeah? Yeah, a few. Not that many. Yeah. Oh, okay, now they're... Yes. And uh, do we maybe also have capitalists in the house tonight? <laughs> yeah, we all are, says so someone. Yeah. Through our pension funds, we may all be capitalists. Yeah, who knows? Uh, do we maybe have Marxist capitalists? They also exist. No, not quite. Well, um, it is uh, uh, my, my great honor um, to introduce to you our, uh, our special guest of the evening. Um, one of the most cited humanity scholars in the world, um, David Harvey, Professor of Anthropology and Geography at uh, the City University of New York, where um, he is director of the Center for Place, Culture and Politics. And um, Mr. Harvey has actually taught uh, Das Kapital for more than four decades. Um, his course on um, Das Kapital is um, uh, actually um, has been downloaded by, by over two million people. Um, if you haven't checked it out online, um, please do so. It's, uh, it's, it's really uh, um, uh, quite, quite fascinating. Um, and it appeared on the, uh, on the website only in, in mid-2008. So in a few years' time, uh, over, over two million views. Uh, this year, he published uh, uh, this book that I, uh, I just raised, uh, 17 Contradictions and um, the End of Capitalism. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, he is here, so please give him a warm welcome, Mr. David Harvey. Yeah, well, thank you for... Uh, this opportunity um, and we're here actually I'm, I'm here actually to participate in this uh, conference uh, which is trying to reevaluate what Marx was about and what his work stood for in the light of his uh, actual manuscripts 
Uh, now, I don't consider myself uh, an authority on Marx. I don't consider myself an, uh, an expert on Marx. Um, I'm a sort of a fellow traveler, in a way. Uh, and my real interests have always been in uh, urbanization and urban change and urban uh, configurations. And I went to the United States in 1969 at the end of a decade of uh, urban uprisings. Uh, and I ended up in the city of Baltimore about six months after a large chunk of the city had burned down in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King. Now, there's a story about uh, English academics or British academics who go to the United States. And that is, they get there and they either go to the far left or they go to the far right. Uh, well, as you can see, I went to the far left. And frankly, it was the experience in my encounter with the city of Baltimore uh, and what was going on in the richest country of the world and the world's hegemonic uh, capitalist power that was so appalled me that I thought there has to be some way of understanding uh, this, uh, this situation. And frankly, I found all of the social science literature that I had been weaned on, uh, including economics and sociology and so on, just didn't seem to have a framework to understand what the dynamics were and what I was encountering. And when I got to Baltimore, uh, I got involved in a big study on housing, uh, because clearly the lack of housing provision uh, adequate housing provision for marginalized populations uh, was uh, part of the problem of uh, uh, inner city uh, impoverishment. And, and so uh, what I did was to start to study this but couldn't find a, an intellectual framework uh, that was satisfying. So it was at that point that I sat down and I thought, well, I'll read Marx's Capital just to see if there's anything in there that's of any use whatsoever. So I sat down and I with a bunch of graduate students and we read it after one year and after one year we all decided we hadn't understood a single word of what we were really reading. So we decided to go back again and take another look and see what was going on. And during this course I had this very inter interesting interaction which has actually been true for all of my academic life. That I was writing this big report on housing in Baltimore. And on page one of Capital, volume one, and you find this distinction set up between use value and exchange value. And it's a contradictory relation. It's one of the first contradictions I look at in 17 contradictions. And a house has a use value and it has an exchange value. We're delivered housing increasingly in, in a city like Baltimore via an exchange value system, which obviously is not providing adequate use value. So there's a, this is real tension in the housing market around this kind of question. And therefore, there has to be some way in which the exchange value system has to be restructured in order to provide use values to marginalized populations and populations with low income streams and the like. So um, I was part of this group uh, writing this report on housing, and we were working with landlords, bankers, federal officials, city officials, all the rest of it. And, and, and uh, this group looked at me and said, well, okay, uh, you're British and you know how to write, so you write the, you write the report, you know. <laughs> so I got landed with writing the report. And so I thought, well, I better frame it. And how do I frame it? So I framed it around the idea, this distinction between use and exchange value. And I thought this is a very interesting way to look at it. Uh, and, and it made a lot of sense to me in terms of what the dynamics I was hitting at. So the report comes and we, well, the report's finished and everybody kind of looked at it and said, well, that's interesting. And we put it to the bankers and we put it to the, the landlords and we put it to everybody. And their immediate response was, this is a fantastically interesting way of looking at housing. And I thought, my God, do I tell them where it came from? <laughs> and, and of course I didn't. I didn't dare, you know. But actually, one of them kind of said, you know, we thought you were one of those economists and you were going to us all that demand and supply shit. Well, that never works. <laughs> but this is a really interesting way to look at it. Let's, you know, let's, 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 uh, and, 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 and so on. So I thought to myself, well, you know, if that concept on page one of volume one of Capital makes so much sense to all these people around the table, then why not use it? It's common sense. 
It's very easy to understand and it catches your attention. And if you ask people politically, do you want to live in a society where some people are maximizing exchange value and whether you get the use value or not depends purely on the rationing of the market system? Or do you want to live in a society that delivers adequate use values to everybody in some sort of reasonable way? What would you choose? Most people would say deliver the use values. So politically it also makes some sense. And actually when you read on in Marx you find the abolition of exchange value is one of the long-term objectives of what a transition to socialism would be about. So, so to me, working on this, I thought to myself, well, you know, all those frameworks I was reading in conventional social science did not make sense. This made a lot of sense. And it not only made a lot of sense to me, it made a lot of sense to people around the table. And, and so I thought, well, you know, if I can get this from page one of Capital, I better go to page two and see what I can find out there. So then I kind of went on through, and, and actually there's a lot of, of beautiful, commonsensical understandings which come out of capital when you learn how to read it right. And that's an interesting kind of question which we're going to obviously get into uh, tomorrow. Uh, and and, and, and so, to, so to me, uh, this was a kind of a bit of a revelation, so I stuck with it. And I, I kept on having all of these, these sorts of experiences uh, with, with these insights that came from reading... Uh, Marx and Engels and, 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 and so on. And for instance, one of the great lines in the housing question of Engels is that the bourgeoisie never solves its housing problem. It only moves it around. And, and I thought that's a very interesting way to think about it. Because in Baltimore, that's what, exactly what had happened. The federal government had funded all kinds of revitalization projects in this part of town, and that part of town did get better for a little bit, but another part of town went down the chute. So you're moving it around. And Engels then kind of says, you know, people, what they do is they, they, they you know, the bourgeoisie claims great, you know, great credit for improving what we now call gentrifying a neighborhood and say, look, it's much better. Look how it looks beautiful. It looks beautiful now. And then you kind of say, but are the same people still living there? The answer is no. Where did those people go? Well, they went down and they made a slum somewhere else, you know. I mean, this is the, this is the, the dynamics you go on. So I was again another meeting with all of these sort of uh, officials and there was a, a, a president, a vice president of the Chase Manhattan Bank from New York was invited down to Baltimore. And uh, I, I gave a talk about the housing issue and I talked about this thing about not, you know, well, a lot of these projects we're looking at don't actually solve the problem, they just move it around. And therefore, what we've got to do is to try to uh, come up with a housing structure system and finance and all the rest of it that doesn't have the effect of moving it around. And uh, by then, some of the people in the city had decided I was a bit of a lefty, and therefore they went after me and they started attacking me. And I was defended by the vice president of the Chase Manhattan Bank. It's the only time it's ever happened, but it, <laughs> he, he really defended me. He said, look, we did this big renewal effort. I mean, I mean there was some serious corporate stuff on this in, 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 in New York in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. He said, we went to a lot of work on this. We did a lot of work on this. And, and at the end of the day, we, 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 were, we were very proud of ourselves for having changed this neighborhood, but then we found out the same people were not living there. So this problem of moving around is very crucial, and you know, we've got to deal with it. So he was right on my side. You know? So it was kind of, again, it was a commonsensical kind of thing, and, and, and people could see it, and, and easy, easy, if you like, to understand, and the dynamics was really there. The funny thing about that story was, afterwards he says, well, where did you get that idea from? It's so good, have you published much? And I said, well, actually, I thought I'd fess up this time. And I said, I got it from Engels. And he says to me, is he at Harvard? <laughs> so so the, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that, that actually my reading of Marx was always a very practical reading of Marx because I was interested in these dynamics and I was interested in what was going on on the ground uh, around me. And the way I did it was, very, was, was uh, a lot of the time I was you know, involved in these reports, doing some of these researches, you, you know, reading other people's reports. I was also you know, clipping news items out of the, the press and, and taking stuff from all over the place. So one of the things I was really interested in reading in one of the papers that was being delivered tomorrow is how much Marx was always clipping newspapers. Because I, I still have a, uh, cartons of, of, of clippings 
from sort of uh, early 1970s about you know what was going on in terms of the dynamics of, of, of transformations in, in, in Baltimore. That was, a, and I was getting this sense that this thing is in motion. It's moving. And there are institutional arrangements, and there's class privilege, there's, there's, and there's ripping off and stealing going on in all this kind of thing. So, so, so I kind of find uh, the practical side of Marx being terribly important. And, and, and to be honest, if, if something comes up and, and you wade through one of Marx's theories and I just can't make it work for me in an urban context on the ground, I kind of say, well, in that case, Marx is useless. I mean, Marx was not a god. He didn't get everything right. He got a lot of things wrong. He got some things crazily wrong. Uh, but then it turns out, and this is, again, one of the things that really comes out of uh, uh, the manuscripts being published, is that, that Marx was writing, uh, particularly in volumes two and three of Capital, was writing a lot of stuff based on notes and a lot of ideas and their conflictual ideas. And essentially, he was writing them in a vein that kind of said, well, this has to be further examined. This is an idea that needs to be taken up. And this is kind of a possibility. So, so what comes out of reading that Marx is one of, of infinite possibility of interpretation and, and, and the like, which, of course, is great for Marxists, because Marxists love to get at each other. So you can read this stuff and kind of, uh, obviously there's going to be some great fireworks tomorrow, I'm sure, you know, sort of, you know you're right, know you're wrong kind of, kind of stuff. But, but, what, but one th piece of, which is a bit consensual in the literature I'm reading about it, because I, I, like I said, I'm no expert, but is that Engels actually turned Marx into feeling far more definitive than he actually was. That there's a questioning Marx there, whereas... Uh, Engels tended to treat all of these manuscripts as sort of uh, kind of uh, penultimate uh, drafts of a book almost there, whereas really they're pre preparatory notes for, for, for investigation. And in some instances, Engels tightened it up and made it more assertive and, and all the rest of it. And that's, again, something that's coming out of uh, the study of these, these notebooks. Now, this coincides, of course, with... Uh, in a sense, a different, a very different situation in which uh, we, can, we can read Marx uh, in these times. When I was first reading it, of course, uh, uh, the Soviet Union was still there, China was still very Maoist and, and, and all the rest of it. And there were strong political parties around, particularly in Europe, who had a very distinctive line. If you're in the Communist Party, you believe this. If you were part of uh, Mandel's Trotskyist movement, you believe that. If you were, you know, so there were all these kinds of different things. And so there was a lot of, 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 of competing dogma around. Uh, uh, but a lot of that has, has disappeared. Uh, not entirely, of course, but uh, the Communist parties have disappeared. The power of the Communist uh, movement and of course the Soviet Union has, has, uh, has, has collapsed and China has gone uh, kind of neoliberal with Chinese characteristics or state monopoly capitalist with Chinese characteristics, however you want to call it. So, so we're in a very, very different situation uh, in which it's possible, I think, to liberate Marx from certain of, its, of his historical chains which were built by the Marxist movement around certain of his propositions. And there are a number of his propositions that I never found very convincing, uh, even when I first started reading Marx in relationship to the things that I was interested in, which, I've, as I've said, was urbanization, uneven geographical development, uh, what is happening to people on the ground in a city like Baltimore, what are these social movements in the city about, to what degree are they class movements, and how can we understand the relationship of those movements to the trade union movement, what's the relationship between politics of the, in the residential sphere, politics in the, in, the, in the workplace, all those kinds of questions. So, so to me, uh, like I said, I've, I, I always had a, a somewhat skeptical view of, of some of the elements within uh, the Marxology I was encountering at the time. Uh, for example, since I was interested in urbanization, I had to familiarize myself with the question of land price, land rent, and all the rest of it. So in The Limits to Capital, which was the first book I wrote uh, uh, about Marx in thinking, I spent a lot of time talking about the question of rent because you can't understand urbanization and urban development without understanding prop what's happening in the property market and what's happening up to all that kind of thing. But uh, presentations on, on uh, Marx's theory at the time usually ignored the stuff on rent. 
The same also turned out to be true of, uh, of, of interest and the credit and financial system. So again, I had to find, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with urbanization, you're dealing with uh, debt financed, uh, uh, housing construction, debt financed, infrastructure construction. You're dealing with fixed capital of long life uh, embedded in the land. You're dealing with all these kinds of things. So urbanization cannot be understood without understanding the categories of, 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 of circulation of interest bearing capital and, and the notion of rent. And it can't be understood either without looking at the merchant capitalists and what they're up to. Because when I looked at the problem in Baltimore, what was going on? There were rent extractions going on. Landlordism was a real problem. And, and furthermore, there were all these kinds of uh, crooked things going on in, in, in land financing. There was something called the land installment contract, which was a way of ripping off vulnerable African-American populations in exactly the same way back then as happened uh, you know, just a few years ago uh, also. So, so you find all of this going on. You kind of say, well, this is, this is, this is politics. This is real politics. This affects people's lives. And it's furthermore, it's, 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 it's class politics. And then there were, there were all these studies of the time around 1969 that kind of say the poor pay more. So if you look at the operations of merchant capital within a city, what you'd find is that certain parts of the city, uh, you can get good produce at re relatively low cost. In the vulnerable inner city areas, you get lousy produ products at very high cost. So the, the poor pay more and the poor get ripped off more, this was going on, and you kind of say, this is a class phenomena. And I don't understand why Marxists are not interested in talking about it. Well, it turned out most Marxists throughout uh, are not interested in urbanization. And I've had this big argument with people kind of saying, you know, urbanization is one of the biggest things you can actually look at. I mean, look at the transformation of urbanization that's gone on over the last 40 years. And isn't it interesting that many of the crises we've seen over the last 20 years have been associated based in the property market? Not only 2007, 2008, uh, but you go back and you look and you say, well, what happened in, 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 in Southeast Asia in 1997, 98? Well, it was the, Thailand, it was the Thailand property market that went bust. Uh, Sweden uh, actually went through its own little crisis, had to nationalize the banks in 1992 because of excessive speculation in property markets. In the United States, there was a housing and loan uh, kind of crash uh, in, in 90, late 1980s. Uh, I mean, these, these things are going on all of the time, and, 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 and somehow our Marxists are still talking about, you know, a, a series of crazy propositions about, oh, it's all, about, all to do with the falling rate of profit, or, oh, it's all about, you know, what's going on with labor in the price of production. You're saying, look, I'm not diminishing labor in the point of production. I think that's very, very important. But I'm also thinking about, you know, the class character of people's lives in neighborhoods, People's, the class character of the forces which are arranged around them. And after a while also you start to see that there's a big difference, and this is where a reading of volume two of Capital comes in, between where, capital, where, where value is produced and where it's realized. It's, okay, it's produced in a point of production, we can all, all right, accept that. I mean, there are some problems with it, but let's accept that. But where it's realized is that uh, it may be realized uh, not by the producer at all. It may be realized by the merchant. It may be realized by the banker. It may be realized by the landlord. It may be realized anywhere. And actually, if you start to look, it, the direct producers often work with very, very, very low margins. There's a piece in the uh, Financial Times this morning. The, the operating uh, profit marginal rate uh, of Apple is 27%. So it's, it's, it's making 27%. Foxconn, where all the Apple stuff is made, is operating on a margin of 3%. This means the value is being produced by Foxconn in China. It's being realized by Apple in the United States. Look at the relationship between Walmart and its producers in, in, in China. It's, it's produced one place, it's realized somewhere else. And it's not only necessarily realized by the merchants, it's also realized by all of these others who can extract value from, 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 this, from this system. And, and you can even pay workers more and say, if the workers get very, 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 very tough and struggle very hard, and this was also going on in Baltimore in the early, uh, six, early 70s, the workers very, very hard and they politicized and all this kind of stuff and they managed to get inc uh, higher wage rates. So they're better off, huh? Well, what happens if suddenly, oh, they're better off? Okay, we can charge them more rent. 
okay, what happens if we can actually suck them into the sort of credit relations where they actually, you know, have to pay their credit card costs? I mean, what, what, you know. So again, where capital is, where capital is produ produced and where surplus value is produced and where it's realized are two different kind of things. And you have to understand the, the relationship and the circulation that's going on here between production and, and realization. And actually, when you suddenly look at the structure that Marx set up between volume one and volume two of Capital, volume one is all about production. It says there's no problem of realization. And these theses about the increasing impoverishment of the working classes, which you get in volume one of Capital, is predicated on the idea that the economy has absolutely no problem of, of selling goods. Everything trades at its value. So Marx makes all of these assumptions, actually, in building that particular kind of theory. And actually, those assumptions all carried over into volume three and the way he specified the falling rate of profit. Relax all those assumptions, and you get a completely different story. In other words, Marx is full of contingent propositions, which go like this. If the world is constructed like this, then you see this. But if you change the initial propositions, you get a different story. And Marx is perfectly well aware of that, and these are the kinds of things he usually did. He said, okay, we're going to make a very small, confined model under certain limiting assumptions, and those limiting assumptions are there, and, and then I can define for you what's going to happen. We're going to get a falling rate of profit. But now I relax the assumptions. And as I relax the assumptions, what do I see? I, you don't get a falling rate of profit at all. You get something completely, you know, completely different. So you have to learn to read Marx that way, but you didn't, I didn't need the mega manuscripts to tell me that, because it's obvious when you're just reading the text as they've come down to us that this is what is going on. And it's very surprising to see that those, that the way in which Marx abstracted and theorized about things uh, is, is, is structured in this way, and you get very, very peculiar responses. For example, in the general law of capital accumulation, where he's talking about the production of an industrial reserve army, he assumes there is no problem of finding a market and that there is no, nothing, no implications of the way in which the surplus value is divided between interest, rent, uh, profit of uh, merchant capital, and, and the like. In other words, those, those, qu those questions are completely eliminated from consideration in volume one of capital. Now, is capitalism a world in which you know, those things are, 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 don't go on where there's no implication of how the credit system works and what the credit system is about and how it operates? Well, of course not. And Marx knew that perfectly well, but he would say things like, well, the credit system can come in here, but w we leave that till later. Well, you know, the totality of the thing would require that you get back to what has been left later and, and reintegrate it back into the story which is what I had to do when I was looking at urbanization. I couldn't leave it and say, okay, I'm going to examine the dynamics of the property market in Baltimore and commercial use of land and all those kinds of things. I, co I couldn't uh, examine all of that and say, I'm going to examine it as if the credit system didn't exist, as if rent didn't exist, because I'll deal with them later. I couldn't do that. I couldn't look at what happened in Haussmann's Paris when I did big, the big study on Second Empire Paris without looking at financial institutions, what developers were doing, rent, and all the rest of it. You just, you know. So the practical side of me was saying, well, I need to put all of those things into the picture, and I need to integrate them with some of the dynamics, which, which is, is described in Volume 1 and then is also described in a different way in Volume 2, because Volume 2 is not about production, it's about realization which means that it's, it's about the market. How can you actually take the capital uh, and the value that's being produced and make sure that it gets realized in, in, in the marketplace in some way or other? What happens if there's no market there? And that's where Marx also famously started to say, well, there's a real problem here because the workers are getting poorer and poorer and poorer, and if they're getting poorer, then where the hell's the market going to be for, 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 the, for this product? So you get different arguments coming out in volume two, and at the end of volume one, you see the, poor, the workers getting poorer and poorer and poorer. At the end of volume two, Marx starts talking about the way in which the workers need, uh, their income needs to be jacked up by bourgeois philanthropy and all the rest of it, in order that they can engage in something called rational consumption. And rational consumption, Marx, as Marx defines it, is about the kind of consumption that's required by the producer in order to realize their product. 
So the structure of Marx's argument starts to come in, 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 into vision, precisely, I think, because, because uh, uh, of the necessity of using these, these sorts of things. And then you look and see, well, the falling rate of profit, for example, is specified as if, and it's exactly the same propositions as in, vo in volume one, the, the falling rate of profit occurs because uh, there is an increasing productivity, and as there's increasing productivity, you lead, need less laborers. And if, you have, if labor is a source of value, then there's less value being produced, and therefore you're going to get a declining pot of value uh, because of the dynamics of technological change, which are, uh, which are predominantly labor-saving. I mean, that's the sort of, sort, sort, sort of argument. But that presumes that you can do that without any problem of realizing the, 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 the product in the market and all those other kind of assumptions. It assumes that there's no role of the credit system in here. One of the arguments that I would make is that the repression of wages, which has gone on throughout much of the capitalist world since the uh, mid-1970s onwards, has to some degree been relieved by the, the explosion of the credit system. And as the credit system explodes, then that, of course, gives you a fictive, fictitious demand which is accelerating and in, in some, in some sort, sort, sort of way. Now, this kind of leads people, however, to then, then, then look at what Marx did and kind of say, well, if Marx could specify the falling rate of profit without mentioning the role of, of credit, then obviously what happened in 2007, 2008, and truly there are a bunch of Marxists who really argue this, what happened in 2007, 2008 had absolutely nothing to do with financialization. They must be mad. I mean, completely mad. I mean, I mean, what what a ridiculous proposition! And they said, well, Marx specified the falling rate of profit, you know, without talking about interest, so we don't have to talk about that. But actually, when you introduce the the the, 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 the dynamics of the financial system, you see all kinds of things happening there. And again, one of the things that seems very important to do, and why I've always felt very important to do, is to either broaden the way in which Marx's concepts work so that they can embrace certain situations, or actually to say, well, I, I'm not going to use that idea. I don't think the falling rate of profit is a good idea, frankly. I mean, I think it's a plausible argument that may occur in certain kinds of situations. But one of the corollaries of that argument is that capital should be employing less and less labor. And actually, the world's labor force is expanded by one billion people since about 1980. the one billion more wage workers now than there was in 1980. So first, that's the first piece. And then you kind of say, well, OK, what are those wage workers doing? Uh, are they productive of value or are they doing something else? And we have this habit of saying, you know, car producers are producing value because they're producing cars. And I say, well, what about those people producing hamburgers? And everybody says, well, well, you know, that's not really... You know, it's not masculine kind of banging things and this kind of stuff. There, it's kind of. But actually, actually, why why are people people producing hamburgers not producing value? Of course they are. And and how many restaurants have grown up over the last 50 years? And what's happened in the restaurant trade? And how much value is being produced? And how much surplus value is being extracted? And you've only got to take Marx's definition of value and say it's not simply about the individual laborer, but it's about the collective laborer to say, oh, well, the collective laborer includes the waiters as well as the people who are actually making the hamburger. So let's, let's actually look at the production of value and surplus value in McDonald's. And isn't it interesting that McDonald's is now the biggest employer of labor in the United States, far more so than General Motors that used to be the biggest employer of labor back in the 1970s. The biggest employers of labor in the United States are Walmart, McDonald's, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. But they're producing value, all of them. Okay. It's just we don't like to think, you know, it's not, it hasn't got that image of the, of the of, you know, the unionized worker, you know, of the great uh, sort of hammer and sickle and all that kind of stuff. Somehow it doesn't, doesn't and, and of course a lot of it is precarious labor, and a lot of it is, 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 is temporary, and all, we know all the problems w with that. But we can't actually not sort of take Marx's categories and, 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 if you like, use them creatively. And this again seems to me to be one of the things that actually comes out of my reading of what the, the mega stuff tells us, is that Marx was perpetually critiquing and re-critiquing his positions. And if we like to call ourselves a Marxist, then we should be prepared to do the same. But you often find 
actually a lot of people on the left are incredibly conservative. That is, I have the truth, here it is, don't mess with it. Don't change it. No, it's got to change because things are changing very dynamically. And when people kind of say, look, uh, is this, was Marx's project something that was unfinishable? The answer is, well, yes, of course, by definition. Because history moves on. History and historical dynamics are there. We're living in a different world now, than, so, so we have to actually adjust very much. But we can take some of those initial propositions and start to use them again in creative ways. One of the things that uh, I recognized and had to recognize way, way long ago in the Baltimore housing market case was you're not simply dealing with a commodity that's produced with an exchange value and a use value and all of the things that go on in the exchange value se section. You're also dealing with a situation where there's actually a great deal of robbery and thievery going on. And actually, if you look at what happened in the subprime crisis in the United States, the amount of illegality that was going on was huge. There was downright robbery going on. It was, and a Florida judge at some point uh, said this when presented with all these facts. He said, you know, this is, this is one of the biggest transfers of wealth, of private property wealth, in American history. And it's all been done illegally. The foreclosures, half of the foreclosures were illegal. Now, what's going on in a foreclosure? 11, men, 11 million foreclosure notices have been served in the United States since 2008. 11 million. 7 million of them were actually operated, and about 5 or 6 million of them led people losing their houses. This was huge. And actually, a good half of that loss was illegal. Now, what is this, and how did, how did it turn out to be illegal? What were the mechanisms? The primary mechanism by which it was rendered illegal was, of course, by the credit system. Now, when you look back and you sort of say, well, wait a minute, let, let's see what Marx has to say about the credit system. Well, he talks about it as a vehicle of speculation. He talks about it as a vehicle of extraction of, of wealth. But in the chapters on primitive accumulation, he talks about the credit system as being one of the major re means, means of primitive accumulation. Now, some people say we shouldn't say primitive, we should say original accumulation, but the tendency is always to say, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, this, this transition was going on, which was based on illegality and violence. And, and that, but that all got over, as it were, and then, and then capitalism became kind of legal with some, you know, illegality on the side, of course. But the mass reappearance of illegalities of the sort we saw in the credit system was equivalent to the way in which uh, the moneylenders actually destroyed feudal power way back. And, and, and it's like primitive accumulation, but there's no point telling, calling it primitive accumulation, so I decided to call this accumulation by dispossession. Well, people got mad as hell at me, and they say, well, you, wait, you can't go around talking about accumulation. It's primitive accumulation. You've got to call it primitive accumulation, because Marx called it that. And I would find myself saying things like, you go talk to an Iowa farmer and say, you lost your farm through primitive accumulation, and they look at you and say, you're fucking out of your mind. What are you talking about? <laughs> and you kind of say, you've, this is the, you're in a prime example of accumulation by dispossession, and they get it immediately. Yeah, there's been accumulation, and I've been dispossessed. Somebody has ripped me off. Okay, so let's go, with the, let's go with, the, with the thing of accumulation by dispossession. How much accumulation by dispossession has been orchestrated through the financial system? How much of capitalism's survival over the last 30 or 40 years has been through manipulations of this kind? Well, I can't quantify it for you. I just know that the loss of asset values in the African-American and Hispanic communities in the United States was around somewhere between 40 and 80 billion dollars. Okay. And that around that time, Wall Street was awarding itself bonuses of between 40 and 80 million dollars. Now, I can't show that that money went from there to there. But if somebody loses 80 million dollars over here and somebody gets it for free over there, in particular gets it for free over there for screwing up the world's financial system, it seems to me that actually there's a good argument, inferential argument, that kind of says, look, there's some relationship in this totality, which is robbing off people here and, and, and putting assets over there. 
Again, this is something that you have to kind of look at and, and, and use in a dynamic sort of way. And when Marx wrote one of his great initial essays, which was this kind of for a ruthless criticism of everything existing, it's a very modest title, you know. But when he did that, it seems to me we have to actually exercise that amongst ourselves. And, and one of the great things about reading Marx's texts is that actually he has so many ideas about, you know, how things relate to each other. And what I tried to do in the 17 Contradictions book is to put together some of those ideas around the theme of, of contradictions. And what became very interesting to me as I worked on this was the way in which the contradictions relate to each other. I mentioned the contradiction between use value and exchange value. And it's always, you know, and it's very, very, very critical. But that, you can't have that contradiction without having a measure of exchange value. So you need to have a measure of exchange value. What's the measure of exchange value? It's money, but what's money? Money is a representation of value, which is the social labor which is done, uh, which people do for others, mediated through the market system. But there's a, a real problem. When you look at volume two, volume one of Capital, you see immediately that actually there's a real contradiction between the representation and what it represents. That actually social labor cannot be privately appropriated directly, can only be privately appropriated because the representation of social labor takes a form, i.e. money, which can be privately appropriated by private persons. So there's actually a contradiction between, between value, social labor on the one hand, and its representation, money. Now that contradiction allows private persons to appropriate social wealth. And that, of course, then actually underpins the existence of a class distinction between those who can appropriate the private wealth and those who can have to give up, uh, who, who appropriate the social wealth and those people who have to give it up. And beyond that, of course, then is the fact that, that none of that system can work without private property. And private property cannot re really work without the state. So you've got another contradiction between private property and the state. So suddenly the contradictions all relate to each other. They're all integral with each other. They flow into each other and they support each other. And in certain instances, they counteract each other. That is, if the use value exchange value system gets out of whack, then the state might step in and do something about it. In fact, in this case, what we see is the state stepped in and made it worse through the 1995 Housing Act in the United States, which actually encouraged subprime lending. <clears throat> and it did so for a very good social reason, that is, the poor had no access to credit. So the answer was, give them access to credit. And actually, the left, during the early 1970s, was waging a huge struggle so that minorities, women, and people in general of, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of low means could get access to credit. In fact, that was a left cause. And something was passed in the United States called the Community Reinvestment Act, which forced banks to open up and actually give credit. I mean, in the mid-1960s, women could not get credit. African Americans could not get credit. Recent immigrants could not get credit. And, and this was therefore considered one of the reasons why uh, impoverishment was perpetuated. So, okay, open up the credit. And then what happens? Well, all of this other stuff happens you know, later on down the line. This is what contradictions are about, which is very good politically, because what it says to you when you're thinking about what your politics is about is you be careful what you ask for. Really be careful what you ask for. Because, yeah, they can open the spigots, but if it's a class-dominated system which is going to actually suck wealth out, then there you go, there you go. So there are lots of ways, it seems to me, that by, by giving a much more fluid kind of understanding of, uh, of what Marx is about, it becomes a fantastic uh, base upon which to, to actually start to probe into dynamics and problems of this kind. And, and to me, it's, it, it's, it's been a fantastic experience always to go back in there and, and teach the thing again and then suddenly find, oh my God, you know, there's a piece here that I missed last time, which actually opens up say, a theory of deindustrialization. In volume two, there's a whole theory of deindustrialization, which I never realized was there until I did the companion to volume two, and I suddenly thought, you know, three pages, wow, 
You know, he really, he really lays it all out there very, very, very simply as to why this is inevitably going to be the case. So for me, this is a very exciting moment in the sense that, that there are all these possibilities opening up, partly because there are all these questions about the text, how much Engels actually f interfered and made it into something though that it wasn't. <coughs> uh, all the kind of questions that Marx had uh, asked and all of the potential solutions that exist in those uh, in relationship to those questions and and for me anyway there's the both an intellectual excitement about this but I think also a political is, is, uh, excitement because what those contradictions I'm talking about tell you is roughly what we should be thinking about should we be thinking about the construction of a society in which some people can make immense amounts of money in the exchange value system uh, on, on providing maybe use values and if you ask people well would you rather have a use value de denomination uh, d dominate over exchange value considerations in housing provision education health care you go down the list and even in the United States they all say I'd rather live in a, a, a use value system but people then don't want the state to do it because they see the state as essentially crooked. So you go to another of those contradictions between private property and the state and say, all right, how do we actually transform that world into a world of associated decision-making, management of the commons and things of that kind, I mean, in other words, uh, new institutional arrangements? How do we deal with the way in which money is a representation of value and how money has become uh, actually a law unto itself so that it becomes the representation actually dominates what it represents? How do, we, how do we deal with that situation? So there are all these kinds of political questions that come up. And, and, and by framing those political questions right, I think we can get a different kind of political orientation. Not a program, but a political orientation. Asking sort of basic, basic, basic questions <coughs> as to where we would like our society to head and in what direction it should head. And there are many other issues, I think, of this sort, which I hope will come up. Uh, in the discussion. So let me leave it there and say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. David Horner. Yeah. Have a seat. Yeah. I'm sure lots of you have lots of questions uh, for Mr. Harvey. Uh, there will be time for that later on, but first I would like to, to introduce our uh, two panelists, two extinguished guests we invited to, uh, to discuss some of the issues raised uh, uh, by David Harvey tonight. Um, let me please introduce to you uh, our first guest, uh, our first panelist, Ewald Engelen, Professor of Financial Geography at Amsterdam University and author. Please have a seat. Have your pick. Thank you. And Geert Reuter, Senator for the Dutch Socialist Party, uh, te who teaches economy at Amsterdam University and is an internationally renowned uh, Marx expert. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, gentlemen, but when was it that you were first introduced to Marx's writings? Mr. Harvey, can I, David, can I ask yeah, you? Yeah, well, uh, I started <laughs> to read it uh, when I was 35 years old. I mm -hmm. uh, didn't consider myself a Marxist, so I wasn't. Uh, I just sort of got into it for the reasons I said that mm -hmm. there was no. I couldn't make sense of what was going on around me in any other way. And did it make perfect sense to you the mo first moment you read it? No, 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 no. No, no. no I didn't understand it the first time I read it. <laughs> and then, then at that point, sort of a certain <laughs> feeling of academic pride comes in and you mm. say, I'm not going to let this defeat me. I'm going to really understand this sucker, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. How was how that for you two? What, wh how old were you when you first were introduced to Marxist writings? Well, for me it was uh, uh, a small capital reading group as a second year student. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the time of the, of the uh, movements. Uh, actually, uh, two years after, I, I was teaching it at a at a polytechnique uh, uh, because uh, the students there, uh, social academy, mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, managed to, ex to they, they wanted to, to have to be taught uh, Marx in economics. So, what was your first impression when you read it? When you had, were in that reading group. Well. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, chapters of Capital are extremely 
difficult. I mean, it's not a didactic uh, work. Uh, the, the first three chapters are the most difficult ones of all, of all the work. Uh, yeah. Ewald? Uh, must have been the mid-90s. Um, the Netherlands was undergoing this neoliberal revolution. Public discourse was dominated by the terminology of globalization. It was about free trade. It was about economies of scale. It was completely dominated by neoclassical economics. And I had this gut feeling that neoclassical economics didn't make any sense. And then I, had, I was doing social and political philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. I had two supervisors. I wanted to write a master thesis criticizing neoclassical economics. That's sort of a, a humble <laughs> undertaking um, for your master thesis. I had two supervisors who were basically of your age, David. Um, and they were welfare first in the, uh, the long history of the social sciences. And they pointed me towards some texts that I needed to read. And uh, among them were also texts by, by Marx. And your next question, what were my experiences? Well, one of the issues with the texts of Marx is that you're not only, when you start reading them, you're not only reading Karl Marx, you're also reading the immense amount of interpretations and exegesis that has been given on top of that. And I have found that absolutely in intimidating. So I will not say anything about anything that Marx has written this evening because it's way too intimidating. <laughs> way too intimidating. I'm glad to hear that I was not the only one who felt uh, okay. that way uh, yeah. uh, after first reading Marx. So um, uh, do you all agree that the um, last or maybe I should say current uh, financial crisis created a new interest for Marx? I mean, um, um, is, is Marx more topical now uh, than, than it has been? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what is quite striking, especially in Europe, we have this very sort of divergent crisis experience in the UK and the US versus the Eurozone and Japan. What is quite striking, especially in the Eurozone, is that five years, six years after the crisis, in Europe it started in 2008, in, in, uh, in, in the US the, it's always 2007, so in, in the US it's the seventh years of the crisis, in the Eurozone it's the sixth years of the crisis, it hasn't dissipated, it's still here. And, and of course proof of that, the fact that people still feel that and want to discuss it, is the fact that you could have sold this room out three or four times, something like that. So there is a huge amount of interest in these kinds of critical analysis of capitalism, especially financialized capitalism. What kind of interest uh, is that? Is that is that a predominantly scholarly interest, you think? Or is that uh, a predominantly activist or political interest? What do you think? I, th I think it's a mix of, uh, there is some scholarly interest, but I think uh, I th more people in social movement area are, are looking at it. Um, I think they are looking, however, for people like ourselves to produce uh, literature that they can readily understand. And I get a little angry at my scholarly colleagues because they're very busy making Marx far more difficult than he already is. And, and uh, that's the way, of course, in which you get tenure in academia. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, that actually there is uh, a lot of interest. But I think the other thing that's different now, and I think this maybe is that uh, people are just curious. There, there is, there's, you know, people used to take my capital class and say, I'm a radical, I'm radical, or something. They, they never say that anymore. They kind of say, uh, you know, I just want to know what this this, this guy's about, you know, and, and, and so l let, me, let, me, let me see. But is it only about what the guy is about, or is it also trying to make sense oh, oh. of the conjunction? I think, I think they were like me, you know, way back, you Cur know, they, they can't, they're curious, because they're angry. sitting, yeah, they're sitting in these classes, and they, they don't make, that doesn't make any sense, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, econom yeah. economics 101 doesn't make sense in relationship to what's yeah. going on, yeah. so they want to, they want to have something else. Yeah. But have those people changed? Have Marx's readers changed? I mean, you've been around, you've, you've, you've read Marx for the last four decades, yeah. um, um, have, have, have they changed and has the, has the dialogue and the discourse changed? Oh, I think so. And it is more around this curiosity. And I think that uh, people don't actually, well, my students don't like uh, dogmatic readings. They, they want to. And I tried to do the companions in a way to say, look, here's how I see it, but you can make up your own mind kind of thing, I think. Even, even your classical economics students don't like dogmatic teaching any longer. Right, right. They yeah, want to change the curriculum. You teach, you, you yeah. teach economy at the University of Amsterdam, Geert. Yes. Uh, 
It's very interesting that in, in, in standard macro and microeconomics, which are the, the main fields, that uh, money plays no role. Uh, money is a convenient uh, medium of exchange, and, and that's it. Uh, and okay, there is also a course taught in uh, money and banking. <laughs> These courses are separate, separate terrains. It's up to the students to to connect those because the the professors won't. Eh? They, they are their own fields. And well, it's it's it, the 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 actual the actual bankruptcy uh, out there uh, shows also the, the bankruptcy of of this of this way of, uh, of looking at the world. I mean, the mainstream economics uh, way of, of looking at the world. I'd like to, to get back to, to Marx. Um, um, David, I once read uh, an interview where you said that you do get invited to talk uh, uh, and discuss Marx, uh, to talk about and discuss Marx on BBC, but not on um, uh, NPR, American uh, uh, Public Television. And you said, there is a kind of taboo in the mainstream media on taking any of this seriously. Yeah, yeah. Where, where is yeah, that coming I, from? Well, it's the long history of McCarthyism and that mm -hmm. uh, there's still plenty of people who, if you, as soon as you mention Marx, start screaming about you're an apologist for the murderous behavior of Stalin and Mao and all that kind of thing. And they then threaten you with all sorts of things. So it's, uh, you know, so there's... It's a, still, uh, still yeah, like that. Oh, yeah, there's still some of that. But, but, but there's a very, uh, of course, the media is, is uh, incredibly centrally controlled and financed. And uh, NPR, for example, if I got on NPR, uh, major contributors would likely withdraw their, their support uh, for NPR if, uh, if I was on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's all part but, but of... It, but it isn't it, because what I found quite striking about your uh, lecture that you just gave was that you're actually arguing against a dogmatic interpretation of yes. Marxism. Yes. My own experience when dealing with people who call themselves Marxists is that they have a tendency to become believers. Um, and that is something that I p personally find highly unattractive. Um, and that has everything to do with the fact that um, what you want to get at is the workings of, again, the current conjuncture of financialized capitalism and that basically requires you because it's extremely complex it has all these strange interlinkages across scales etc etc so you need a big toolbox and the toolbox can consist of quite a lot of different kinds of theoretical perspectives and it doesn't matter where they come from as long as they provide you with access to the stuff that you want to undisclose right. Right. and that actually sort of suggests that you should be like a theoretical magpie using different elements uh, and uh, what you sort of suggested is that that's the way you read Marx you see it as a series of notebooks different approaches different possibilities and you use those possibilities in order to understand some of the things that you're fascinated by but that's not my uh, sort of common experience when I deal with Marxists what do you what do you think around this table what do you think the biggest misunderstanding is out there about Marx's uh, work well the, the, the biggest I think he almost mentioned it mm -hmm. the biggest misunderstanding is that uh, Marx's main work capital uh, is about socialism or, or communism. Uh, I think the, the, the term co uh, communism is mentioned some ten times in, in a footnote, 2,200 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, then Marx also wrote a, a political pamphlet, the Communist Manifesto, and there you find one page, one page with principles of socialism. Uh, and you find one paragraph, about nine lines, about what uh, communism is about. And, uh, and that's it, mainly. Uh, so Marx, Marx is a... Uh, this doesn't mean that Marx wouldn't find that, uh, that, uh, that important at all, but I, I, in my view, he didn't see that as a, as a writing desk uh, matter. I mean, the, the road to 
uh, to socialism or, or, or communism or, or whatever. He was sympathetic with that, but he didn't see that, that as, a, as a writing desk matter. And, well, a precondition for him to, to get that way is to, is to first understand capitalism uh, thoroughly, and, and that's, in, in fact, the, the object of this, this main work, Capital, that he, that, he didn't, uh, that he didn't finish. That he didn't finish, and that uh, uh, is maybe unfinishable, the unfinishable project yeah, of, I, uh, of the I, conference. I agree, I agree with Harvey the, on the this The object, The object changes continuously, yeah. which is one of the issues that social scientists are being confronted with. It's not an unchangeable object. The, the object transforms itself. There is, of course, some, some elements of it which are more durable, but it, it changes, and that, that is, at the same time, the fascination of Yeah, but there are also it. important continuities. Sure. I mean, uh, we, we have a, a class relations. Yes, class relations, exploitation of labor. Uh, but the, banks, manifesta the banks, manifestations change. Banks take a share in, in the no. interests of, of no. the, pro the, the, the profits produced in enterprises by labor. I mean, that's, there, are, there are a number of important continuous relationships, and, and then further, you're right, I mean, there are the, the, the complexities of, of the financial system, uh, well, that, that but what I, what I find Sorry finished. to interrupt, yeah, sure. but what if Marx, what if we could invite Marx uh, to join us at this table, and, and what if Marx would be actually witnessing what's happening in, in the world today, some of the uh, phenomena of which you, you have just uh, eloquently described. What if we could uh, time uh, uh, um, Zoom uh, marks into uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street protests or the Indignados or uh, fly him to the World Cup protest in Brazil or the recent uh, uh, European Central Bank protest in, in, in Italy. What do you think he would make of what's happening today, David? Uh, I... Th uh yeah, I mean, actually, I think he'd be mystified, as he was back, I think, in 1857 or so, uh, by the fact that there's not a revolutionary movement. I mean, so many people have been ripped off so badly around the world, everywhere, that you would have thought that by now people would have said, enough is enough, let's get rid of this system and make one that's much more humane. I think, he, I, I think I, I, my, my guess is he would, he would be appalled that, for example, uh, I mean, the amazing thing about those foreclosures that I mentioned, uh, maybe six million people lost their homes and preliminary surveys about what they thought who was at fault was they blamed themselves. Yeah. This is a yeah, yeah, classic yeah, yeah. neoliberal yeah. personal responsibility yeah. kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And he would be appalled at the state of consciousness yeah. uh, that existed. Yeah. If you even take the Netherlands, the Netherlands lost uh, potential output to the tune of something like 25% since the outbreak of the crisis. Um, Dutch taxpayer had to pay 125 billion in order to save banks. That's approximately, again, 25% uh, of uh, Dutch GDP. Um, we're still in the midst of a crisis, a lot of bankruptcies, especially sm small and medium-sized enterprises, people looking at negative equity, uh, almost a third of all people with a mortgage uh, loan contract have negative equity. Um, and I just, um, before I came here, I looked at Twitter. What is trending in the Netherlands is black peat. And that is sort of uh, that the huge amount of distraction that is being provided by all these sort of superficial, <coughs> quasi-political issues, which draw so wow. much political attention. I oh, think hey, that get that real. This is about the bankruptcy of financialized capitalism. And what do we do? We zoom in on Black Pete. It's a I side think, show. I think uh, that real. is a discussion. That is a discussion that uh, not everybody in this room uh, might agree on uh, with you. Um, but can we agree to, to actually park that discussion for another Bracketed. night? Um, I'm not going to attend that evening, by the way. Obviously not. <laughs> um, but what I would like to, to take from your point is uh, the lack of um, um, revolution. Uh, that Anger. Would lack of anger, yeah. lack of movement uh, uh, yes. actually propelling forward. W what do you think, Geert, is the explanation for that? Well, my impression is that uh, if you get to kind of revolutionary mo uh, movements anyway, that is not, that is not in, a, in a crisis, that is in a, 
in the in the in the high in, in, in the high luxury day. of, of in of high days, in high like days. in the in the sixties, for example, sixties, early seventies, mm -hmm. these were high days. Uh, so you're saying actually the conditions uh, for, the, for uh, people to uh, yeah, actually uh, unless people are starving. Yeah, that yeah. that's not a matter. People are, like people are starving. Yeah. Uh, that, that may uh, give rise to but uprises. There, but there have been, but there have been some very significant movements. I mean, over a million people took to the streets in Brazil last year. But a lot of these movements are ephemeral. You know, they sort of rise and fall very fast. Uh, we've seen, uh, we saw what happened in Istanbul around Gezi Park. Uh, and have, again, a lot of these uh, uprisings, by the way, uh, the thing that connects them together is that they're all about the qualities of urban life. And mm -hmm. you see, this is where my focus on the city becomes, I think, terribly important. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're not so much uprisings in the workplace. They're, you know, bus fares in Sao Paulo, spending money on uh, World Cup. Uh, and Olympic uh, things when actually you need it on housing and health care and education, uh, all those sorts of things. And, and again, Gezi Park was about, you know, the, the, the kind of way in which the shopping mall is displacing. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and, and the other thing that's interesting about them is how contagious they can be for a very brief period. Like in Turkey, it went from Ankara mm -hmm. to Ankara and then to Izmir and then the, all the Turkish cities were in uproar. And, and the same was true in Brazil. It starts in Sao Paulo and then it's a uh, sea phase. Uh, yep. you know, and, you know, so, so we do have a pattern of social protest right there, but it, it is typically short term, uh, unpredictable, because, you know, Stockholm, right? Suddenly there was yeah. a kind of yep. thing last year. So you never know where it's going to break out and what it's going to be about. And, and of course, we're seeing a rerun of some of the issues in, uh, in, in Ferguson, in Missouri, the, 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 those sorts of things. But one of the things that attaches to this, of course, is the incredible militarization of the response. Yeah. And that is, I think, one of, the, one of the key things we're looking at. And the militarization in itself is creating another form of response, yeah. which is an attack upon the militarization. And nobody knows quite how to deal with uh, the fact that in Ferguson, I mean, it's a, it's a small community that had, had enough tanks there and enough armor Crazy. to kind of, yeah. you say, what on earth is this doing here? And, 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 and what are they preparing for? And the and, uh, same was true of Occupy. Occupy immediately gets attacked by the police uh, in the way the Tea Party never did, you know. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, I think the political response right now is itself uh, really, really troublesome, but at the same time is eliciting a certain kind of opposition. That triggers my, my last question uh, before I, uh, I give the floor to, uh, to you, because I can feel the questions burning here in the air. Um, last question to you now is, is a peaceful transition still, still, still possible? How, how big would you, would you say the likelihood of that is, David? Well, I think you're likely to see two, two twin things. I mean, I, I'm personally very interested in what I call uh, revolutionary reforms. That is the kind of reforms which, uh, when they're pressed further, become revolutionary. I mean, Marx uh, was interested in the abolition of the wages system, but then the first step was the shortening of the working day. And the realm of freedom begins when the realm of necessity gets left behind, uh, this kind of language. So I, 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 kind of th I, I kind of think about uh, certain uh, uh, reforms which have the seeds for uh, further pushing. And, and uh, you know, I always go back to something like uh, the Meidner plan in Sweden and things like that, which I think were, 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 were ways to, 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 to maybe do quite a bit. But as I've said, uh, I think the violence of the response of the political classes right now which is extreme, those classes are extremely wealthy, have no empathy whatsoever for the, the state of life of the majority of the population, and basically look at to the state to say, crush those people if they get out of line. And I think that, that we're likely to see, therefore, uh, violence, which is gonna come from that quarter, and it's gonna elicit violent responses. And they've got spaghetti on their bookshelves. 
to uh, Let's, uh, show that I have a conscience. Have a look at the yes. audience for questions. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to collect three questions at once and I'm going to give them back to the table and uh, ask the, uh, our panelists to reply to three questions. So, my first three, yes. I'll start with you. Yes, please, if you could, um, I'll hold the mic, because I'm a control freak. Um, <laughs> uh, if you could introduce yourself and ask your question. Hello, my name is Jurian Bendin. I have a question of uh, David Harvey um, uh, about contradictions. Uh, a logician would say um, uh, a co anything can follow from a contradiction. So uh, what I'm really trying to get at here is um, how do we get from this mess of contradictions to a successful campaign? Thank you very much. Question number two. I saw hands here. Yes. Um, there was a, a question, what would Marx do at this table uh, in these times? And I, I'm, I'm very brief. Um, I've got a connection with him, of course. And he is saying that under the present circumstances of the existing relationships, the production force has become destructive utterly destructive. It, that is, of course, we experience now with the, uh, with the uh, environmental degradation, etc. And then his solution, thus things have now come to such a pass that the individuals must appropriate the existing totality of production forces, not only to achieve self-activity, but also merely to safeguard their very existence. And that's very much going on now against everywhere the cracks coming in capitalism everywhere we see flowers coming up in those cracks and self-activity and and to safeguard the very existence it's very individuals and associations self-activity it's very remote from any stylistic thinking Thank you. so i'm sorry but i i didn't i didn't get the question did you get a question or is no. that just me yeah. no no so what is your question no, I ask, where does this come from? I ah, where does this come from? That was the question. Okay, thank you very much. I'll come to you later. No, but these are all men, and I'm a feminist, so I uh, give the floor now to it's a woman. The yes, oh, there you go. Thanks. My name is Angela, and I've or got or a question mm -hmm. uh, for the entire table, or actually mainly David Harvey. Um, capitalism without a state is a chimera. It's a utopia. Uh, it cannot exist without uh, state infrastructures. Um, I, in, in rebel cities, uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, anarchists, uh, David Harvey. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, can we envisage a non-capitalist state? I would really be interested in uh, you answering these, these questions because you, in all your work, you you never really answered that fully. Thank you. Okay, so I go back to the table now. Some tough questions uh, for you all. Uh, first, about the contradictions. Uh, then I'm not going to repeat the quote, but what did you mean by that or where does that come from? And the last question uh, about uh, the possibility, the feasibility of uh, actually uh, a non-capitalist state. Well, uh, the con contradictions, uh, um, yeah, they're, they're, I think they're indeterminate in the sense that you're, you're saying that uh, they can go on for a very long, long time. Uh, the question is, when do they get to a point where something has to give? And, and my argument uh, would be that, just to go back to the use value, exchange value uh, argument, uh, if you had a choice between uh, supporting the continuation of an exchange value structure that uh, allows wealth uh, to be sucked out of the mass of the population in, order, in return for providing minimal use values of, of affordable housing, for example, for the mass of the population. I think you would say we want a system that provides affordable housing for everybody. Uh, we have this crazy situation in most of the major cities of the world right now where upper class housing, condominiums and things like that. I live in New York. You go around and there are there are big uh, condominiums and, you know, at 9 o'clock at night there's no lights on in them. Nobody's living there. Uh, they're just simply speculative items uh, for people to play games with. Uh, at the same time as there are, you know, thousands of people homeless and, and a lot of people living in inadequate housing. And you kind of say, that's the kind of situation I want to remedy. 
and I want to pay attention to the use value side. And if the exchange value side is not doing it right, then we, you know, we abandon the, the using that and we find some other mechanism, which uh, ties back into the state question. Is the mechanism going to be the state? Uh, Marx was a bit ambiguous about that. I think that his initial response to say, well, it should be associated laborers uh, getting together and deciding on their own production. And so, so it was a model of uh, worker control, in a sense, which was the beginning point for a transition. But then I think Marx also recognized that when it came to big infrastructures, like, uh, you know, uh, building a whole transport networks or sewage systems or water supply systems, that you needed, you couldn't do it simply through a bunch of associated laborers getting together and saying, okay, we're going to build uh, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge or uh, something. Things can't happen that way. We can't build airports that way. We can't. So we need some kind of apparatus that has the capacity to provide infrastructures. Uh, and I think it's very difficult to imagine an apparatus that doesn't look something like the state. I would like, however, to also point out that there's a tendency to homogenize the state the state has arisen itself in relationship, in response to trying to control certain contradictions. And one of the theses I put here is there's no such thing as a non-contradictory answer to a contradiction. Uh, and, and therefore the state is itself full of contradictions. And we see how the contradictory aspect of the state has been actually uh, accumulated <coughs> by an oligarchy and a capitalist class essentially to its own, own benefit, but there's no reason why uh, some form of state could not actually be designed and, and, and constructed. And I think that uh, it's interesting that several of the groups I know, and I'm very sympathetic to the decentralized uh, assembly type of politics, which you often find, but it can only go so far when you get to a certain, certain questions of, of scale of uh, operation. Uh, assembly structures don't, don't really work. So I. Yeah, I get, uh, you know, I quite like some of the anarchist proposals. I like re reading Murray Bookchin and things like that, I think, because they're, uh, they're, they're very democratic and, and, and I think give a good scenario for how, how the democratic base to a socialist society might work. But, but uh, uh, there are problems when you, you move to this other scale of, of what has to be done. And there is a myth that somehow or other global warming will be solved. Uh, by everybody being decentralized. Well, actually, uh, be careful what you wish for, because that could make things very much worse unless you really look out. So again, there has to be some mix of, of, of layers of things, and that, that, that seems to me obvious. And, and I, ha I get a little impatient with those groups on the left who have that, what I call a fetishism of organizational form, that there is only one organizational form uh, that we can admit, and if, it, if, it, if, it's, if it, it's not horizontal, then we don't have anything to do with it. The so answer. even there you argue for the fluidity that you yeah, argued for. Right. for no, no, no. Uh, can, I, can I, sorry, can I, in, in, for the sake of time, because there's yeah. a lot of people still, right. can I ask you to, to respond to the gentleman who wanted to get your... Uh, yeah, yeah. Ma, uh, well, uh, as I understood it, uh, we're, what, what we're talking about is uh, some of the Marx's proposals uh, in relationship to, uh, again, uh, one of the myths about Marx is that he was in favor of, st of, of state control. Uh, in the United States, Marxism is understood as st a dictatorship of the state. Uh, but Marx was not in favor of dictatorship of the state, and I think was beginning with that associated laborers actually getting together and transforming their own conditions of production. And we do see in solidarity economies and all these other things that are occurring all around the world, signs of this happening. And, and, and there is a decentralized kind of movement. But as I've said, I think that it has limitations when it comes to things like, you know, dealing with the fact that uh, one of the big scarcities in the world right now is water. And water provision is coming critical, and the idea that you know decentralized communities will uh, collectively end up doing something which is going to be good in terms of the water situation is just 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 not there. So that you need have some supra organizational form, which is going to deal with uh, the scarcity of water resources. 
All right, I see lots of hands, um, and uh, I'm going to ask your permission to run a little bit late. Is that okay? I usually ask the, the crowd's permission because maybe there's people who have to catch trains. We're supposed to end now, but I also really would like to honor uh, the energy in the room. So uh, we're going to run a little bit late. I'm going to collect two more rounds of questions, so maybe we do four now. Can you deal with four? Yeah? yeah? So, okay. All right, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, my name is Gert Jan, and uh, I would like to like to ask David, uh, is there any hope left for the working class now the robots are coming? Aha, good question, <laughs> good question. Uh, yes, my question is also to Professor Harvey. Um, you mentioned early in your uh, lecture that uh, Apple uh, makes a 26% profit while its uh, manufacturer, if I understood correctly, makes 3%. Um, to me, this makes perfect sense, as there's a lot of more like design, intellectual things going on at Apple than at the manufacturer. So I was wondering what was the point you wanted to make there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Robots, Apple, um, I'm moving up. Yes. I'm Payman Jaffrey. I have a comment and a question about the lack of resistance, uh, anger. Uh, I totally agree with AWOL that there is lots of distraction, but uh, the point of Black Pete is that the distraction is that people are busy with racism, but no, it is important because Marx was writing about the necessity of the solidarity between Irish workers and British workers, for instance. Thank you for making that point. There is a question. I had a question. Um, uh, David was rightly uh, talking about the importance of uh, realization of value and that lots of movements are being shaped around that. But of course, still, it is important uh, what is happening at the point of production and there are still strikes going on. And how can we bring both together? Because that's, uh, I think, very important for the coming uh, period because we are going through a transition of reformation of working class identity, consciousness, and even composition. And that's the reason why we have a lack of uh, resistance. So if we can maybe manage to bring those together, uh, we can move forward. Thank you very much. Last question on this round. I saw your hand. I'll come to you in the next uh, last round. Hi, my name is uh, Renato. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm actually going to connect with uh, the previous question. Uh, here in the Netherlands, there is a notion of freedom of expression, which is often used uh, as freedom of oppression. Uh, so freedom of expression, you can say you are racist, you can say you hate women or whatever. And uh, I actually see th this kind of behavior in Brazil manifestation who turned out to be very far right. And the results are being seen now in the election. We have the most right parliament in 50 years. I would like to ask the table and Mr. Harvey, what, what do you think about this kind of uh, new subjectivity that is uh, becoming uh, explicitly uh, a bit fascist. Thank you very much for those questions. Let's start with the first question uh, on the robots. Should the working class be afraid? Yeah, I think, I think they, they should. But at the same time, I think that uh, you've got to be careful not to fight. I mean, the left fought uh, a losing battle against automation and manufacturing. Uh, in the 1970s uh, into the 1980s, uh, deindustrialization. The same thing is now happening in services. Uh, you go to the airport and you check yourself in. You go to the supermarket and you check yourself out. I mean, uh, so this is all this is all happening. Um, but there are still, uh, I think, uh, many areas which are uh, increasing and expanding, and there are limitations on. Uh, on, on, on robots, but we shouldn't, I think, uh, resist automation. I actually think automation is a good thing. Uh, the question is, well, how do people, you know, what, is, what does work mean in, in this new situation of, of, of uh, uh, you know, order, artificial intelligence and the like? Right, let's um, move to the second question of the gentleman in the corner about um, uh, value uh, added um, yeah, well, uh, by uh, Apple. Yeah, well, you know, the there's, there's a whole argument right now about cognitive capitalism and that somehow or other scientists produce immense amounts of value, whereas workers on the production chain don't. Um, if Apple got 10% uh, and uh, Foxconn got 10%, that might work, but this is just simply monopoly power. Uh, and monopsony, which is being used uh, and is used by Walmart as well. Uh, by the way, Walmart doesn't innovate much. I mean, at least, you know, Apple does. 
so, so uh, I think that you have to be very careful about venturing into this, this world of, uh, uh, you know, taking one line out of the Grundrisse about uh, uh, the general intellect and turning it into a general theory of cognitive capitalism seems to me to be kind of a bit shaky cognitive stuff. Cognitive capitalism, but, but the, you, you, yes, you, 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 you forget to mention the, the tax arbitrage which is conducted by Apple. Um, most of their profits yeah. is kept outside of the U.S. jurisdiction, yeah, right. so they don't pay any taxes, which basically mean that they don't contribute to the maintenance of the material and immaterial right, infrastructure, right, right. which is, of course, suggesting that the profitability is coming out of fiscal creativity. Yes, hmm. a, lot of it, a lot of it is. Well, a lot of major corporations these days are financial corporations, absolutely, absolutely. even though they sure. make yeah. General Motors. Yeah. Yeah. Then to uh, the point of the gentleman uh, there in the uh, green sweater. Yeah, I think that, I, no, I mean, yes, of course, there's, there's a lot of work going on. And, you know, and uh, I was like the way Gramsci talked about this uh, way back in 1919. He kind of said, okay, the factory councils are very good, but they sound, they're sectorally organized. We should organize the community because in the community we put together street cleaners and bankers and all this, and, and, and bank clerks and, and, and all the rest of it. And we get a better idea of what the, the total condition of the working class is. We get a much better perception from there. By putting those two together and having an organization in neighborhoods and connecting them to organization uh, in, in the workplace is, is, is the optimal form of, uh, of, of politics. And this gets back to the kind of question of subjectivity. I mean, I think a lot of uh, issues these days uh, are, are about uh, the creation of subject, political subjectivity. Uh, and, you know, this is a big topic, and, and I don't think uh, I can go into some of the things I think about that uh, here in any, any detail, but it clearly is something that has to be, uh, has to be looked at. I mean, the, the way in which neoliberalization uh, has been about a transformation of political subjectivity on the part of very many elements in the population is in itself, I think, uh, and a, 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 an indication that political subjectivity is not something that's fixed, it is actually created. And, and therefore, one of the failures of the left, I think, has been not to be working on kind of the transformations of political subjectivity in a mass, uh, in a mass way. Uh, and that means producing the literature is producing the thing, but that then requires building access to the mass media, it be all, all kinds of things of that sort, which are very difficult to do given the concentrations of political power right now. And does that also um, partly explain the rise of fascism in a country like Brazil, like the gentleman over there? Well, yes. I, I, I mean, you know, I think it's... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, this is even more, more serious a problem it seems to be in Europe than it is in, 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 in Brazil. Uh, it's uh, very, you know, countries like Hungary and so on are just, just appalling right now. And uh, it's very difficult to see how there can be any you know, radical transformation. And mm -hmm. Right, now... Um, yes, I will come to you, but first I promised a gentleman over here that has been very patient with me. I'm going to ask you to be concise. The announcement said, uh, talked about Piketty, and I haven't read his book yet, I have to confess, but it is, his analysis Don't is supposed it. to be that the rise of interest on capital is rising faster than what laborers can earn. What can Marx add to that analysis? Interesting oh. question. What can Marx add to Piketty? Now, on my way yours. down, here we have... I, I thought uh, I saw oh, two hands here. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> okay, so I was really interested in your um, theory of accumulation of dispossession. I don't know if I speak it out correctly. But um, I was wondering how uh, it relates specifically to uh, oppressed groups according to you. Uh, for instance, women, uh, ethnic minority groups, you mentioned the, the idea of loans, that it was first an idea of emancipation and well, that really turned around. But there's also been some criticism on Marx that he actually never dealt with sexism explicitly and that he really thought that uh, it was natural for women to uh, well, um, act in a certain way. So how would you deal with specific oppressions like that? Interesting question. We actually partly discussed that over dinner, so I'm glad uh, glad you asked uh, that question. Yes. Um, also to Professor Harvey, um, 
I, I really enjoy the fact that you are non-dogmatic about, about Marxism and in my own sort of drive to also try to find new sources to be non-dogmatic about reading Marx, I came at some point um, to Hannah Arendt and I haven't read a whole lot of uh, thoughts by, by, by you in your books, but I haven't read all of them, I must admit, um, about their relationship. And one of the things that she says that I'm particularly interested in is that Marx's idea about history, Marx's ontology of history, is very similar, actually, to capitalism's ontology of history, namely as development, as unfolding, as, as teleology, and that there are certain problems with that. And I, I was wondering whether you could speak to that and what you think about Arendt's interpretation of Marx. Now, um, we've talked a lot about uh, subjectivity. I'm going to be very subjective and you are going to ask the last question of tonight. So I know there's still other questions out there, but if you could come to the microphone. Uh, my question is about revolutionary reforms. I really like that idea. And my question is, what are criteria to say that the reform is actually really revolutionary? And second, does David Harvey have any ideas, concrete ideas for revolutionary reforms at this moment? Thank you very much. Now, back to, yeah, you can clap for that. Definitely can. Where should we start? Shall we start with the question uh, by the gentleman Piketty? What can yeah, Marx actually add? Well, well, Piketty did not write a book about capital and didn't write a book about uh, the capitalist mode of production. He, he wrote about uh, a, a thesis about the production of inequality uh, and then came up with this very kind of uh, simple kind of thing about, uh, you know, the rate of growth versus the rate of return on capital and said you're going to get increasing concentration of wealth. Well, kind of, well, that's what Marx says happens in volume one of Capital. Uh, so, you know, why bother to read Piketty when you can read <laughs> volume, volume one of Capital? And, and, and I think it's very, it's very interesting. These things come out at certain political moments. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, the Keynesian left in the United States has felt disempowered for some considerable time, you know, people like Stieglitz, Krugman, and so on, are not being listened to in the, in the where it really matters, and they seized on that book and used it, I think, as a vehicle to get their own voices heard. So they started praising this book to the sky. So everybody, so it became a bestseller, and it's it's, it's renowned, I think, for being the most the, the most unread bestseller of all time. That is, people don't get beyond about page 20 and uh, then uh, put it on the table and make everybody impressed by the fact that they've read Piketty, you know. Let's move to, uh, to the question uh, here on my right uh, about um, uh, gender and Marx's work. Well, well Mar yeah, Marx was a bit uh, ambivalent uh, on, on this. He, he made some very kind of sexist comments every now and again and he then made... Uh, I think some very uh, profound comments about new new relations within the family and the role of women and things of that kind. So, you know, you can take it uh, both ways. But he was basically a uh, Victorian and had a certain kind of Victorian sense of morality. So I don't, you know, again, this is something I don't. There's a lot of things in Marx. I kind of say, okay, well, you know, he's he's that's that's where he's at. And uh, it's not as if I look to Marx for guidance on. Uh, on, on, on questions of, of gender or, 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 or race or, or, or the rest of it. But, but then Marx's topic was not that. I mean, one of the things I did in the Contradictions book is to say so there's a difference between capital and capitalism. Marx basically uses the word capital all the time. It, it's a bit rare that he uses the word capitalism. Capitalism is the whole historical formation, if you like, which exists, which is, which is complicated in all its kinds of ways, whereas the theory of capital is specifically about how the capitalist mode of production works and what its internal contradictions are. And that's what he's after in capital. So his, his, uh, his, his objective is, is not to unravel all of those things. And you can kind of say, all right, well, I'm not going to read him because he doesn't, un he doesn't deal with the questions I want. But on the other hand, if you want to know how capital works, then there's probably no better guide to it than actually going through and looking at Marx and, you know, working through some of the ways in which he sets it out. And we have two, two questions left. We have the question here um, by the gentleman um, um, asking... Um, oh. I'm trying to rephrase it and I'm losing it. Can you, can you summarize it? In? 
Oh yeah, about Hannah Arendt, of course, how could I forget about Hannah Arendt? And we have the question uh, by the uh, lady over here uh, about uh, revolutionary reforms. Yeah, well, again, so we start with uh, Hannah Arendt. In writing, uh, well, you probably might want to, but, but in writing, uh, yeah, Marx often wrote in a way that's a bit teleological, no question about it. But, but actually, when you get into him a lot of the time, what he says is, is it's impossible to be teleological. <laughs> It's not, uh, it's not a linear unfold. I mean, he does use that language sometimes, but other times he uses a completely different language. And then you decide to yourself wh what kind of language you want to you wanna go with. I, I'm a kind of anti-teleological, and I think the unfolding of contradictions is a much more interesting way. And when you look at those unfoldings, you end up with a non-teleological, because there's all these possibilities, uh, which can mean you can go this way or that. Um, I found Arendt very useful, by the way. I used her a lot in... Uh, uh, the New Imperialism book, because she has, a, I think, a very good take, and in particular understood the role of primitive... She and Rosa Luxemburg, between them, understood, I think, the role of primitive accumulation and the continuity of, 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 of primitive accumulation. And, and so I, I find her, her work uh, uh, quite, quite interesting. And then there's a question about revolutionary uh, reform. Well, there are, there are lots of... Uh, um, Re revolutionary reforms, which it seems to me the, 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 the simplest way to look at it is to say we well, have to undo uh, all of what Thatcherism was about, we have to undo all of what Pinochet is about, and to their credit I think the student movement in Chile is probably most strongly uh, able to articulate that it's not just simply education, it's also the whole ball of game that has to, has to change. And, and to the degree that political consciousness and subjectivity was, in a sense, remade by Thatcherism, and, and, and actually, she really actually thought that. I mean, she said, my task is to change the soul of the people, and if I can do that, that is the most important thing. And she really did a good job of it, as I mentioned with the, in the case of the foreclosures. And so revolutionary reform also would be to kind of say, open up the university to the kind of stuff that we're doing, open up uh, the media to the kinds of things we're, we're talking about, open up the discussion of political subjectivity in a new kind, of, a new kind of way. Because to the degree that people, I think, understand what is going on around them, and, 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 and to the degree that we can, on the left, create a, 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 a non-dogmatic voice about, about, about transformative possibilities, and then it seems to me that uh, we, we'll have a much better, better chance of uh, changing things in ways which we're going to deal with uh, many of the crises that exist around us. And, you know, there are other things like a guaranteed income, all those sorts of things which would, it seems to me, you know, go some way towards... Uh, alleviating the current situation, but once once you move in that direction, you're moving in, a, in, in an entire... In, in other words, you've got to turn the neoliberal prospect around. I mean, OK, we had the crisis of 2008, but people still think neoliberal mm -hmm. and actually... and think there's a neoliberal solution to it, and in fact there is a neoliberal solution, which is concentrate wealth and power even more among the upper classes. They're the only ones who've come out of this crisis better off than before. Uh, they are absolutely stinking rich right now, even more powerful than they were before. In fact, they've, they've had a good time in this crisis. They really have. They've done extremely well. The, the oligarchy has done extremely well. The people have done very badly. And if people understand that formula, the banks have done very well, but the people have done very badly. Why do we live in a society in which those people do very well and the rest of us do very badly? That's a simple political question. And if we can transform that then it seems to me that uh, we're on a form to uh, a reform which is kind of much more towards a revolutionary transformation. From revolutionary reforms to revolutionary transformation. I would like to thank you very much, Mr. David Harvey, for enlightening us tonight. Thank you very much. And of course, also... A warm thank you to my two panelists tonight, Geert Reuten, Ewald Engelen, thank you for joining us tonight. No, no. Yes, we want to... On Saturday afternoon...
There's going to be a manifestation against TTIP, which is another sort of example of the corporate capture of the state apparatus, both in Europe and in the United States. So if you want to join us for that manifestation, you're very, very welcome. Thank you, Ewald, for that call. I uh, particularly would like to extend a warm uh, thank you to the people joining us on live stream. Of course, also thanks to you for your patience and participation. My name is Kirsten van Nul. Keep changing. <laughs>